Welcome to Pastor Bill's Classroom. This study is in the Acts of Jesus, Lesson 46, A Reason to Suffer. Well, hello. Glad to be back. Good to not see your faces, I guess. Here I am by myself uh, one more time, but glad to be here. Sorry I've been gone for a couple of weeks, one time family emergency, and then this past week I planned uh, vacation, actually planned last year, but COVID bumped us a year, and the people that were going to bis the trip through said, you either take it now or you'll lose the money you put into it. So we didn't want to do that. So anyway, here I am back, and I appreciate your patience and uh, appreciate your faithfulness and watching and studying, and it would really encourage you to study these. I, I, you know, I'm not going verse by verse, line by line, just because it's just more of a sermon series than it is a Bible study. Even though it's, I call it a Bible study per se, I prefer the line by line, verse by verse, ex, expositional stuff. But I would encourage you to take these. Uh, I've known several people that have gone and just taken my sermon, listened to them, sit down with a group of people, have a conversation about them, come up with questions, apply them to your life. Uh, there, you can go a lot further with these. I'm not writing you know, questions per se for these, but you can, you're welcome to do that, and I would encourage you to do that just because the information here is good and can, can lead to a lot of other conversations, a lot of important conversations. There's also verses that I'm not covering here that you could also cover, and it makes for a fairly simple Bible study. Somebody was asking, how do, we, how do, I, how do I lead a Bible study? I said, then just sit down with somebody's sermon, mine or somebody else's, and then just ask questions at the end. Uh, apply it to yourself. How do you feel? How, do you, how does this apply to you? How does this affect your life? Uh, uh, maybe watch a week in advance and then discuss it the following week. Or you know, there, There's lots of ways but, uh, that you get in a conversation and in a small group with people who can encourage you and you can study and encourage each other in the Word. Highly recommend that. So just by way of introduction and uh, thanks for the time off. And here I am back and glad to be so. So let's begin uh, our time together with a word of prayer. We're going to be in Acts chapter 21. It's where we left off last t two weeks ago. And we'll be picking it up there again uh, somewhere about the first part of the, of the chapter. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can gather together to study and uh, listen and hear you. And uh, thank you for these that have been faithful to listen and study. Pray for those that are leading Bible studies, however they're doing it, God. I pray your blessing and hand upon them. Uh, God, as we, as we study ourselves and we lead others to study and grow in you, it's, it, there's such a blessing in that. And I, I want that for them just as much as I enjoy it myself. And I pray your blessings over this time. I pray that you would open our eyes. I pray that you would teach us that we'd be um, able to receive the things that you're, you're speaking to us today. Thank you again for this place. Thank you that we've, we've had a year together and, and it's been a good year, uh, albeit... Um, very different. Thank you for holding our hand through it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're Acts chapter 21. We're going to be down about verse 8. And we're going to be there in just a second. The last time we were together, two weeks ago, uh, and we're going to be continuing today in that study here in Acts. But last time we saw that Paul uh, got some very bad advice for some very good people. Uh, for very good reasons. Uh, they were Christian people, but they gave him very bad advice, and it opened this whole conversation that we had together, looking at the whole issues of both giving and receiving advice, and what the scriptures have to say say about that. And so that was last time together. We're going to be continuing looking at this whole question of of Paul as he's going on his way to Jerusalem and headed there, uh, as we're going to see, headed into lots of trouble uh, by the will of God, which raises a lot of questions. And so we're going to consider some of those questions today. But let's take a look at what it says here. Uh, kind of going over um, verses we've been over already, but but uh, with a different headed with a different conclusion or different point here. So let's take a look. Verse eight it says, "On the next day, we departed." Remember, this is Luke writing this, and it's somewhere earlier in in the process of Paul's missionary journeys, Luke, the the writer of the book of Acts, the writer of the book of Luke. Uh, Doctor Luke has joined the entourage of those who were with Paul ministering, and so. That's why Luke says in his writings, we did this and we did that. So on the next day, verse 8, we departed, came to Caesarea. Now they're in the land of Israel and entered the house of Philip the evangelist, who was one of the seven. We stayed with him. Now this man had four virgin daughters who were prophetesses. And as we were staying there for some days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. So here comes this, this man uh, led by the Holy Spirit, as we're going to see coming down to, to speak to Paul. It says, and coming to us, he took Paul's belt. It's kind of strange. Bound his own feet and hands, even stranger. 
This saying, this is what the Holy Spirit says. In this way, the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him to the hands of the Gentiles. So he's making a prophetic utterance. He's saying, listen, something's coming for you, Paul. It's going to be tough. Uh, there's trials and tribulations facing you. You're going to be bound uh, by the Jews in Jerusalem. And it says, when they heard this, we all, uh, as well as the local residents, began begging him not to go up to Jerusalem. So like I said, some bad advice from well good, well-intentioned people. Paul was going there because God called him to he was. So how, how is it possible that he's going to a... Does God ever call us to a place of suffering? Now we'll get to that. Paul answered, what are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart, for I am ready, he says, notice, not only to be bound, but even to die at Jerusalem for the sake of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we fell silent and remarked, the will of the Lord be done. Isn't that what we always want anyway? Isn't that what we want? So why are they advising him differently? Because like I said, you're, our hearts are involved in it. When our emotions get involved, uh, it's tough uh, to make a good call. No, anyway, that was a study last time. But uh, this time, uh, we're going to look at a different set of questions that, that bubble up out of this situation. So Paul is headed, according to the Holy Spirit, into trouble. Even though he's being fully obedient. How is that possible? How, how is it possible that, that Paul, going in obedience to God in Jerusalem, suffers abuse and imprisonment, which is what's coming from. I mean, is that the way you think when we obey God, that that's what the conclusion is? I mean, do Christians actually suffer even though they're right in the middle of God's will with their lives? The answer is, yes, they do. Yes. Which begs another question. Why? Why do they suffer? And that's what I want us to deal with today. And it's not going to be an exhaustive study on the whole question or whole issue and answers of why do believers suffer at any given point in their lives, but it is going to be some of the main issues here and it's certainly involved in the story of Paul, uh, to be sure. So let's, let's go over what's happening here. Paul's, Paul goes to Jerusalem in obedience to the Spirit of God. He arrives there, knowing what's going to happen to him. He does everything right. He goes to the elders of the church, the elders of the church say, listen, there's this huge rumor going out among the Jews saying that you hate the temple and that you hate the laws of God. We know that it isn't true, Paul, but in order to prove to the Jews that this isn't true, we want you to take these men who have consecrated themselves, take them to the temple, pay their, the temple tax and other things for them just to show that you're not against the temple and against the law, which of course he was not. He was certainly a Jew in every way and there's nothing wrong with being a Jew. And, and the, nothing wrong with the temple. Of course, that's, that's God's temple. And so uh, they said, go and do this. So he does all these things. He does them all right. But as a result, he's attacked by his own people. They try to kill him. We haven't read that yet, but I'm just reading ahead for you just in my mind here. They try to kill him. He's rescued by the Romans. And they throw him in prison for almost two years for doing nothing. So, wow. I mean, what gives, right? I mean, maybe you're thinking, well, I thought that, that if we obeyed God, everything would go well for us and, and uh, we would prosper and not, not be harmed. And, and um, I'm not sure where you read that. <laughs> because here's what I do know, though. You didn't read that in the Bible. Because that is not what the Bible teaches. Uh, here's just a snippet of some of what the Bible teaches concerning suffering and trouble and trial. 2 Timothy 3.12, Indeed, all who want to live... In a godly way in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That's not fun. That's not easy. That's not, oh, oh, I want to do that. That's not that. Notice, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, you're asking for it, in other words, because you're living in a Satan controlled world. So should, you should expect this. Why, why would we expect that when we, we do the right thing that everything should go like peaches and cream? I don't know uh, where we got that idea from. Like I said, it's not from the Bible. Here again, uh, Jesus' own words, John, speaking in John 16, 33. I have told you these things, he's telling his disciples, the 12, right? So that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. That's pretty clear, isn't it? But take heart, I have overcome world. In this world, you will have trouble. A promise of God. It's going to happen. As a follower of Christ, it's going to happen. It's just the way it is. I mean, think about it. Jesus was the only one who obeyed the Father completely in everything, right? He was completely perfect in all of his obedience. If he did everything right. How did it turn out for him? Well, they killed him. So why should we think that being obedient to God leads to a happy, perfect life. I mean, happy life, yes, but perfect life, no. 
without trials, without trouble, without persecution? Where do we get that from? So let's get back to our question. So, let's, so we know for sure, yes, the answer is yes to do Christians actually suffer, although doing everything right, just like Paul does, just like we do, just like Paul did. But so let's get back to the, original, the, the, the last question. Why do believers suffer even though they do this? So it's the why, not do they, but why do they suffer? And so I'm going to give you three different reasons. Again, this is not an exhaustive list. This is just a, a large topic list, broad spectrum. In fact, the very first one is, is the most overarching of all of them. The number one reason why we suffer, uh, even though we do what God wants us to do, as in the case of Paul, is we suffer, listen, for the purposes of God. Sounds nebulous, doesn't it? Sounds ambiguous, doesn't it? And the purposes of God. Doesn't sound like an answer, does it? Well, it is. The purpose of God means I don't really know what the answer is. I can't say it's this specific thing or that specific thing. I'm just simply suffering. I'm going through the trials because God so ordained it. Is that okay with you? It really needs to be okay. It really does. We suffer for the purposes of God. Look at, look at what Jesus said to his disciples here in John chapter 9, verses 2 and 3. This is about a man who was born blind. The disciples come to Jesus and says, why was he born blind? Jesus, they call him rabbi here. His disciples asked, rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents? They only had in their minds that you only suffer when you do the wrong thing, you see. They had no idea that you could do all the right things, still suffer. To them, there was a direct line of relationship between doing the wrong thing and experiencing bad results every single time. Now, not to say that you can't suffer for that, but they only had in mind the two things. I, if I do what's right, I get good things, and if I do what's wrong, I get bad things. And the truth is, is that you may have bad or good for neither one of those reasons. Notice the way Jesus answers. It was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so that, notice, the works of God might be displayed in him. The works of God, the purposes of God might be explained to him. We, we exist, listen, to bring glory to God. That's our whole purpose. We don't live for ourselves. We live for God, right? You say that. Do you believe that? Here, here's a demonstration. You're seeing it right there on your screen of a person who, who is bringing glory to God through what he experienced. He was born blind. Now, his story's in the Bible now. His, he was healed, of course, from his blindness, and that's the whole point of the story, he brought God glory, but he experienced a good chunk of his life in which he didn't see. I, I bet he wasn't too happy with God at some point in his life about that. What do you think? Probably, right? Do you think he's still mad at God about that? So he, he's in heaven. Jesus healed him of his, his blindness, but ultimately he healed him of his spiritual blindness. This guy was saved. He, he became a Christian. He's now in heaven. He's sitting uh, with Jesus in heaven. Do you think he's still upset at Jesus about having him born, be born blind? Or, or do you think possibly he's saying, way to go, Jesus, that you got my name in the Bible and that my, my life and, and the things that I experienced and the things that I suffered for your purposes brought you glory? Good question. Why, why do you think, let's get back to Paul. So we have Paul's imprisonment here. He's, he's headed to Jerusalem for uh, God's purposes. And part of that is that he's going to suffer. He's going to be treated badly. He's going to be persecuted. He's going to be put in prison for no reason for more than two years. Um, was that for the purposes of God? Or maybe a better question. Was God glorified in that? Well, that's actually an easy answer. Because here's what happened when Paul was in prison. Paul was in prison two different times. This is the first time. And on those two different occasions he was in prison, he, listen, writes the book of Philippians, the book of Ephesians, First and Second Timothy, Titus, Philemon, he writes six books in the New Testament through which we grow and learn and experience, through which the Holy Spirit speaks to us and has been speaking through these books that Paul penned while suffering for no reason, seemingly, other than the purposes of God. And God has been glorified in those things in us for now, how long? 2,000 years. Wow. For the purposes of God, he suffered. And God was glorified in that. Life is short, and listen to me, if you expend it on yourself, and that's all you do, you have truly wasted it. 
Don't waste your life. Don't you want to bring God glory? Don't you want to? Are you, are you willing to? I mean, that's what we're here for. Are, are you willing, listen, to suffer for that? Hmm? To be lied about? Paul that was. Mistreated? Paul was. Treated badly? I mean, think about it. How was God glorified in his son Jesus? Think about it. Through his death. Yeah. Yeah. Through his death. Man, we got most of us. God's not calling us to that. But Jesus is. Listen, Jesus says, take up your cross daily and follow me. Why? Because he's already got a cross. You know what, you're, you, know what you do when you carry a cross? It's not, it's not the pain or the struggle or the weight of it. You're, you're headed somewhere to die. You're not worried about the splinters or the weight or the distance. You're worried about what they're going to do to you on that cross when they get to the place where they're taking you. Jesus says, take up your cross daily and follow me. So I'm, I am truly dying to myself anyway. In order to bring glory to God, that is the only way it works. So, so we suffer, listen, number one, for the purposes of God. Number two, we suffer so that we can see ourselves. What am I talking about? Trials, trials have a way, tribulations have a way, difficulties, persecutions, have a way of bubbling to the top the stuff that we didn't know was in there and, and making us, as a result, better people. Notice what it says here in, this should say James. Actually, I missed that verse. There's, and there, I missed that one too. There it is, James, I apologize. A little out of sync here, y'all. I don't know, I've been gone too long, I guess. So we suffer, here, here it is. We we suffer so that we can see ourselves and be made better as a result of it. Notice what it says here. Consider it all joy. Now, this is very interesting. So it's to be joyful. Yep. My brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials, is, is that the way you're handling it right now? Is, is that the way you're, you're dealing with this? Considering it joy? Because that's a commandment, scripture. That is. Not a suggestion. Consider it all joy. That's, a, that's an imperative. Do it. When you encounter trials of various kinds, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, makes you better. And let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be, notice, perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Isn't that what you want? I mean, I have two options here in front of me. I can remain the same old cruddy self, or I can get better. In, in fact, become complete and perfect, lacking nothing. Which, which, would, you, which would you choose? I'm going to choose this one too. I want to become better. I don't want to stay my same cruddy self. I don't want to be the same next year as I was this year. I want to get better. Well, here's what you need to know. A lot of times, many times, most of the time, we don't get better without trials and tribulations. We just don't. We just don't. Notice the, the test here, notice carefully, is not for God's information. It's for your information. So God puts us through trials so that bubble to the top stuff we didn't know about ourselves. We get introduced to ourselves, basically, through trials and tribulations. Because I, I thought I was a better person than that, right? Wow, I was shocked at how I handled that. Yeah, you thought you were doing better. But God knew differently. And, and part of getting that stuff out of you that you don't like, and he doesn't like, that you want to go away, that he wants to go away, is to put you through trials and tribulations. One of the reasons why we suffer so that we can see ourselves. So Paul, Paul had a lot to see about himself. He learned a lot about himself in prison, I guarantee it. Learned a lot about God. Learned about, a lot about his faith in that two-year ordeal. You think about the experience that the disciples had, uh, just speaking of trials and tribulations and finding about yourself. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he had the 12 in front of him, and he said to them, today you're all going to leave me. You're all going to leave on account of the suffering I'm about to experience. Basically, basically what he said to them. And all of them, to a man, says, no, we will never leave, never leave, never leave, never leave, never leave, never leave. Peter doubled down. He said, even if everybody else leaves you, I will never leave you. Remember what happened to Peter? You know what happened to the disciples? First of all, the disciples all split. As soon as they captured Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, they all split. Peter hung on. He goes to the courtyard, remember, but he winds up denying Jesus several times publicly. Why? Was Jesus shocked at this? No. He told Peter he was going to do it. 
See, it's not that God needs information about us, but we need information about ourselves. And trials often are the only way to get the real you. You may not like what you see, but the real you to bubble to the top. That's one of the reasons why we suffer, so that we can see ourselves. Persecution, listen, may reveal whether you prefer the affirmations of God or the praises of men. Tough financial times may, may reveal, do, do you really trust a God who is the provider? Illness may reveal. We say that we will glorify God no matter what, no matter what station of life, no matter what situation, no matter how healthy or sick I am. Well, illness demonstrates whether that's really true about you. It does. These trials are coming. There's an opportunity for us to grow. We, we, suffer, we suffer to see ourselves. We suffer to learn. Listen, to grow. Here's the, the we just looked at the at James. Let's let's back up and see James again. James one, two, and three. Consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Notice, consider it joy. Notice it improves you. Let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. The words of James go right along with the words of Peter. First Peter one. In this you greatly rejoice, do you? Do you? Even though now for a little while, necessarily, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, you rejoice even in the midst of them. Why? Because you know what the result is. So that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, will, which perishes, though tested by fire, may be found to result in the praise, there it is again, glory and honor in the revelation of Jesus Christ. So, so you rejoice, not because it's a lot of fun to go through trials, but because you know what the result is. You get made better, and as a result, Jesus is glorified. Again, the purposes of God are served. You're, you bring glory to God in your life. Well, what are you here for anyway? Why does God leave you here? Except to glorify him. One of the clearest, listen, episodes of godly people suffering for doing what's right is Daniel chapter 3. Remember what happened in Daniel 3? You got the three friends of, of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember what those guys did? So the king makes this 90-foot statue and says, bow down to it on pain of death. If you do not, you're going to be thrown into the fiery furnace. Remember what the guys do? What do they do? They do the right thing. Good Hebrew boys, love the Lord, want to honor him. Whether they live or die, they're going to honor him. He's going to be glorified in their lives. And you know what? The king decides he's going to kill them. They're good guys, but he doesn't need them that bad. They disobeyed his direct orders to his face, and so they get thrown in the fire furnace. Wow, that's not the way we think of it, right? If I do the right thing, everything goes well for me. Where do you get that? In the Bible. We live in a terrible world. They get thrown in a fiery furnace. We still, listen, our God is still a God who lets us be put into the fire. It needs to be okay. It really does. Because hear me on this, there are some things that can only be learned in the fire. How, do you, how, do, how are they to know if God could really deliver them unless they're thrown in? How well, they learn that? How can they know that God can come and walk around inside the fire with them? Well, they learned that, didn't we? So do we. Through their trials, God was glorified in their lives. They did the right thing because it was the right thing, not because they got something from it necessarily but so that God could be glorified in their lives, that God could be honored, and that God could do and teach them things that they couldn't learn anywhere else. God is a refiner, and he refines us through these fiery trials. When, when, when a silversmith puts silver into a furnace, he only does it for one purpose, and this to make the silver better. This to refine it. And when, when they refine silver, no, no two lumps of silver are the same. They have different forms of impurities and different amounts. And so there's no set time when you throw silver into a furnace. There's not like, okay, we can start the clock and it's going to be ready in 15 minutes. No, every, every lump of silver is different. So, so what he does is he watches it. He puts it into the furnace. He, put, he puts it in there and he watches it. And, and of course, what happens to the silver as soon as it gets really hot is impurities bubble to the top. See, see when God refines us, when he allows us to be put in the fire, he, he's, he's refining us. And the first thing that happens is what we thought wasn't in us, what we thought, who we thought we weren't anymore, turns out we still are. Those things come to the top. The reason why they're there is so that we'll deal with them, so that we can meet ourselves and deal with ourselves. It's not because God didn't know. 
because we didn't know. But God, just like the refiner, doesn't leave us in the fire permanently. The refiner puts the silver in the fire only for a certain amount of time. You leave it in too long, it'll destroy the silver. He only leaves it in there until he can remove the, the, the impurities from the, the surface until, listen, the silver, how does he know when it's ready? When the silver is like a mirror and he can see his face. God leaves you in the fire. He leaves me in the fire for longer than we think it should, right? Longer than we think we can endure. Surely there's nothing else in me that needs to be refined anymore, but God leaves us in there because he, until he sees his face in us, until his likeness appears in us. Is that not what we're here for? Becoming like him, never too early, God isn't, never too late, always on time. God, listen, is not, his job is not to give a quick rescue, even though he will. That's not his main job. His main job in our lives is to refine us. And often, mostly, that happens through trials, the fiery trials and tribulations. True for Paul, true for you, true for me. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for the Apostle Paul and the example that he shows. He's just a regular human, just a regular man, yet he's determined to do the will of God, even in the face of tr difficulties and troubles. He didn't even know going into this if he was going to even survive this, but wound up being thrown in jail for two straight years. But, but such a blessing came out of that. You, you through him, wrote these books, and, and uh, we have his example in front of us. And, and he exists, as he says here, you know, he, he's willing to die if, 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 it, if it means for your glory. God, I pray for the same attitude in us, that we would bring you glory, that we wouldn't be interested in living for ourselves. How sad is that? Instead, we would take up our cross daily and follow you, laying our lives down so that you can take them up, so that you can change them, so that you can make us better, so that you can be glorified in your purposes in us. Thank you, God, for speaking to us today. We lift these things up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptistchurch.org.